good morning to all the delegates attending this conference from india and europe and good evening to our esteemed speakers and delegates from usa and good afternoon to uh, all the delegates from uh, australia new zealand and japan and other places a uh, very warm welcome to our second plenary session uh, this plenary session contains two keynote lectures one will be given by professor scott from uclg the and the other one is by professor rollins uh, from portland college of uh, engineering usca this session will be chaired by professor nk samadhiya uh he is a well uh, well known personality in india as well as outside i just uh, kept a very brief short bio which i will be reading out uh, professor samadhiya is a pro, uh, professor at department of civil engineering iit roorkee he is currently working in the areas of ground improvement rock engineering underground excavations and foundations he is the president of indian geotechnical society he is also the chairman of cd 48 of bas india he has been an active member of tc207 of issmge professor samadhiya has published more than 200 papers in journals and conferences with this brief introduction i welcome professor samadhiya to our plenary session welcome sir thank you thank you thank you professor jakka yeah uh this session will be co-chaired by uh, dr uh, darren dr darren shia is an associate professor at the department of civil and environmental engineering national university of singapore he obtained his phd and uh, bachelor's of engineering from cambridge university and nanyang technical university respectively he secured first class with a gold medal in his um, bachelor of engineering his research interests are soil liquefaction chem chemical ground stabilization mesh machine lining and aerial mapping techniques uh, professor darren welcome thank you welcome yeah. uh, thank you for the introduction Uh, before i hand over the session to our uh, speakers uh, i wanted to make an important announcement uh, regarding uh, q and a uh, there are some uh, problems expressed by some of our delegates so just i will take just two minutes sir yeah yeah all the delegates are attending uh, our uh, sessions through conference online platform by uh, lo logging into this and also it's a good opportunity for us to showcase to our distinguished uh, guests here about our platform uh, just uh, i hope you are all joined our plenary hall uh, from this um, uh, our keynote session from this plenary hall here when you are uh, playing uh, the online session the q and a is available at the menu bar on the top can you see this q and a so you need to pose your questions from here the q and a is not provided over the this uh, screen okay thank you one and all with this i am handing the session to professor samadhiya and uh, professor darren sir please sir okay so a very good morning and uh, to all who are present here in this particular plenary session so this is day 2 and uh, plenary session 2 <coughs> also uh, as uh, informed by professor jakka i am nk samadhiya and uh, my co chair is uh, for this particular session is uh, professor darren from singapore so there are two presentations here and the first presentation will be by uh, professor brendenberg 
of uh, UCLA. So I will <clears throat> briefly introduce him first. Uh, Professor Scott J. Brandenburg earned his doctor, doctorate degree from University of California, Davis. His research interests are geotechnical earthquake engineering, geophysical imaging, data acquisition, and signal processing, and numerical analysis. Professor Brandenburg has received several honors and awards. In 2015, Walter L. Huber Award, 2013, Samser Prakash Research Award, 2012, ASC Student Chapter Outstanding Professor Award, 2010, Arthur Cassegandri Professional Development Award, 2004, UC Davis Prize for Excellence in Geotechnical Engineering, and there is a long list. So Professor Scott Brandenburg is currently handling many research projects being sponsored by Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, National Science Foundation through NEESR program, and National Science Foundation uh, through NEESR program. So uh, with this brief uh, uh, introduction, now I, I would invite uh, Professor Brandenburg for uh, his lecture. His lecture is on single frequency method for computation of seismic earth pressure. So I request Professor Brandenburg to deliver his lecture. All right, thank you, Professor Samaria. I am now getting a message that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Once that's enabled, I'll go ahead and share. Can you please? Hello. There we go. Yes, it works now. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to uh, speak to you this morning, July 13th. Actually, for me, it's um, about 8.30 in the evening, 8.40 in the evening here on um, Monday, July 12th in LA. So I feel like I've zoomed into the future. Um, so I'd like to thank Professor Jaka for inviting me to participate in this conference. I'm sorry I couldn't come in person, but you know, this is nice too, to see everybody online. So I'll talk today about um, a soil structure interaction approach to seismic earth pressures, which is a departure from the limit equilibrium approaches that are commonly used in engineering practice and that a lot of us have, have helped to develop as well. Um, and I'll have to acknowledge all of my collaborators on, on the work that I'll show you today. Uh, first is Jonathan Stewart, also a professor at UCLA. He and I have worked closely on this. Uh, professor Milanakis at the University of Bristol has um, also been a great collaborator as well as Maria Giovanna Durante. Um, from University of Texas, she recently left that position to move back to Italy. And we've had many other collaborators, professors Beskos and Redos, um, Dashti, De Laura, and Tassarolu. And I have to thank the sponsor, the California Department of Transportation. So the outline of the talk, I'll first go through the background or motivation for why we did this work. And I'll talk briefly about current methods that are commonly used, including limit equilibrium procedures, uh, like the Mononobio Kabe method and that family of methods, as well as elastodynamic solutions. And I'll briefly touch on numerical modeling as well. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about interaction mechanisms that are related to soil structure interaction arising from kinematic and inertial SSI components. And I'll, I'll provide a, a Winkler solution. I was just looking through my slides. There are a lot of equations, so I apologize ahead of time for that, but I won't walk through every equation. Um, and I'll point you to a, a paper where you can see those if, you, if you're interested in them. And then I'll move on to a comparison with some centrifuge modeling test data and a numerical simulation program, and finally um, wrap up. All right, so the, the motivation really for this work is that retaining walls tend to perform pretty well during earthquakes, even if they weren't explicitly designed for seismic earth pressures, yet we're designing them for pretty high seismic earth pressures that are um, often fairly expensive. And so when I went to this conference in New Zealand back in 2015, I was excited that there was a talk that was going to cover retaining wall failures during the Christchurch earthquake sequence. And um, this is an example of one of those walls that failed during that earthquake. This is a wall that's protecting a, a slope made of loess. And uh, what they say in the paper is that it was common for these stone walls to collapse. So typically these walls are at least 100 years old, not engineered. It wasn't uncommon for them to have suffered a complete collapse as shown in this figure. 
many of the stone walls acting act as a facing to protect the slope behind it. But when the rock wall failed, the slope remained intact. So it wasn't clear whether that wall was actually holding anything back at all. It collapsed due to inertia loading of the wall itself, not due to seismic earth pressures. And so there's a picture of, of that kind of failure. Uh, and then this was another kind of failure. This is a, a crib wall where the um, size of the openings in the wall was bigger than the size of the uh, soil that was being retained, these, these gravel and cobble sized particles. And they raveled out through the spaces. You know, the shaking was strong enough to start this raveling process that just continued. That's really also not a traditional kind of seismic earth pressure type retaining wall failure. So uh, that, that session didn't produce the sorts of failures that we're often trying to predict when we provide structural engineers with seismic earth pressures, like for a building basement wall design, for example. So although there have been cases of earthquake-induced retaining wall failure, the retaining walls tend to perform pretty well during earthquakes. Uh, by contrast, design earth pressures, typically based on limit equilibrium methods, are often really high and can add significantly to the cost of a project. And in fact, I'll show you that sometimes our limit equilibrium methods don't even provide a physically meaningful solution. So it's a difficult problem for us to solve. Structural engineers complain about the earth pressures geotechnical engineers provide to them all the time. And so my conclusion from that is that there's a mismatch between reality and our assumptions in these limit equilibrium procedures. So let's take a look a little bit at, at limit equilibrium methods. Uh, this is the, the sort of diagram that governs the Mononobe Okabe method, which um, came to us uh, from researchers in Japan back in the 1920s. Um, and what they assume is that you have a, an active wedge with an inertial force acting on it, and that increases the earth pressure that the retaining wall must be designed to um, sustain. So it's a pseudo-static or just a, a static body force horizontally and vertically that's added to account for earthquake shaking. And the equation up there at the top is the seismic coefficient or the seismic component of the earth pressure. There's a static component that, that's added on top of that. And this equation does have a couple of problems with it. And I will highlight those potential problems here in red. So um, you can see that there's a cosine of delta plus theta plus eta term there. Uh, if that, it's possible that that could become um, a negative number or zero. Okay, and if it's zero here, then you have a, a positive constant in the top divided by zero, and that's a singularity. There's also a sine term in here, and if that becomes negative, so if the friction angle minus this eta term, which is related to the horizontal earth pressure coefficient, if that becomes negative, then this sine term becomes negative, and you take the square root of it, and the solution becomes imaginary. So it's not physically meaningful anymore. And so, you know, often we'll convince ourselves that maybe the ground motion is not actually as high as we need it, as we think it should be, and we reduce that ground motion so that we get a physically meaningful solution. But still, it's not very satisfying to be using a method that produces results that are physically meaningless in some cases. It works well if the ground motion is not that strong. And so here's a plot of what the, that seismic um, component looks like as a function of peak horizontal acceleration. And um, this, this comes directly from the Mononobe Okabe equations. And eventually you reach a point where you don't get a physically meaningful solution, which is close to this limit, 0.6 G, something like that, depending on the friction angle of the soil. Um, in 1970, Seed and Whitman found that up to about 0.4 G, the Mononobe Okabe solution was approximately linear. And they just they chose to represent it with a straight line. So KE is equal to three quarters of PGA. Uh, and they said that up to about 0.4 G, that's a, that's a reasonable approximation. Let me turn on my laser. Here we go. So out to about this part, you know, the difference between the orange and blue lines is not very big. This is a really simple equation. So why not use that instead? Um, of course, this doesn't form a singularity. It just keeps going up forever. But they never really intended it to be extrapolated out to higher PGAs. It was simply up to 0.4 G. But Today, a lot of us are using it out to very high ground motions. And there's been a lot of work done recently on this topic um, in terms of physical modeling and centrifuges. And this is thanks to Professor Sitar from UC Berkeley and his research group. Um, also, Professor Dashti at University of Colorado has done quite a bit of work, and that's this Hushmand 
at Al Paper um, and, and with others in, in her group as well. So the, the slide shown here is from Professor Sitar's research group. You can see the Mononobe Okabe solution up here with the red line. Then this is a Okabe solution with some cohesion. Some of the soil they tested was cohesive and the cohesion decreases the seismic earth pressure. This is the Seed and Whitman linear approximation. And then all of the data points are pretty much lower than that. So they saw um, lower pressures than what we would predict. And that's for a wall that is a fairly stiff earth retaining system with two vertical walls separated by these diaphragms. Um, there's another kind of wall that they tested over here, freestanding retaining wall, and the measured earth pressures were even lower in that case. And in this case, the, the bottom can slide, the wall can rock a little bit. And so it's a more compliant system and you get lower earth pressures as a result. So um, limit equilibrium methods assume that surface acceleration directly causes incremental earth pressures. Uh, but that, that seems logical, but it's actually false. And this helps us understand why these limit equilibrium methods are tending to overpredict earth pressures in a lot of cases. They actually may sometimes underpredict earth pressures too. So let me let me walk you through my my sort of uh, reasoning on this one. Um, if you consider the case of vertically propagating horizontally coherent shear waves, you can write out the equation for the acceleration this way, where it's a function of uh, angular frequency, surface displacement amplitude, and then a uh, shear wave velocity for the soil. Um, and the inertia generated by those waves is resisted entirely by mobilized shear stresses on horizontal and vertical planes, so tau HV. Um, you don't get any change in normal stresses, either on horizontal or vertical planes, as long as the soil doesn't have plasticity or generate excess pore pressure or anything like that. If it's an elastic soil, there's no horizontal pressure that's mobilized by those waveforms. So you can get surface acceleration and not get any horizontal pressure. Now, I, I, I know this may not be quite fair because, well, in real life, there's a wall there. It's not just horizontal linear elastic soil. But, you know, I would argue that if you were to make an excavation in that soil and replace it with a structural system that has the exact same mass and stiffness as the soil it replaced, you would end up having no seismic earth pressure on that wall system, no matter how strong the surface um, motion was. So uh, let's move on now to some elastodynamic solutions. There's been a whole lot of classes of these involving various assumptions. Um, among the first ones were by Wood, and then Valetsos and Yunnan have formulated quite a few of these for uh, flexible walls that can rotate at the bottom and so forth. Um, Klaukinas has done some of this. Um, Professor Vretos and Beskos have, have done this for um, inhomogeneous soil and, and viscoelastic soil. And uh, that's the paper down there at the bottom is, is a paper that I co-authored on this topic as well. And uh, in this particular case we're looking at, we're going to assume that the uh, soil is vertically inhomogeneous. So the shear wave velocity increases with depth according to a nonlinear function that's shown there. This is among the first um, solutions by Wood, and it shows dimensionless normal stress. So these solid lines are kind of the shape of the earth pressure diagram. Um, and these earth pressures tend to be quite high, often much bigger than Mononobe Okabe, as is shown here with the uh, triangular dashed line going down to about 0 0.75. So the Wood solution is quite a bit higher in this case. So um, the issue with the elastic solutions is that in order to facilitate analytical solutions, we have to make assumptions about boundary conditions that are often not very realistic. And one of those assumptions is that the elastic layer rests on top of a rigid base. And when you have a soil with a rigid base, there's very strong resonance associated with that infinite impedance contrast. And so uh, as a result, you get really high earth pressures right at the first mode resonance of the soil resting on top of this rigid base. Now the rigid base might be a reasonable uh, assumption for certain systems, like if you have a very stiff wall resting on rock with soil behind it, maybe it's okay. But in general, that's not true. We have a retained soil that has pretty similar stiffness to the material beneath it. And so it's not well represented by a rigid base and you won't get these resonances that are implied by the elastodynamic solutions, which are therefore unrealistic. 
And I'll touch briefly on numerical simulations. I get this question a lot because the solution that I'm going to present is analytical and it's fairly complicated. People always say, why don't you just do numerical solutions? So first I'll say numerical solutions have the potential to overcome a lot of the limitations of limit equilibrium methods and they have the potential to introduce more realistic boundary conditions that also better match reality compared with elastodynamic solutions. However, they require a pretty high level of expertise to do correctly, especially nonlinear dynamic continuum modeling of, of soil and so forth. And for um, consulting projects, you know, you need a fairly high budget. And so it's really only done for pretty important projects. And so while numerical solutions really offer the most robust approach to dealing with the problem, I think we need simpler solutions too that can be used more day to day and don't provide things like imaginary numbers or infinite earth pressures like the modern Obeokabe solution will currently do, especially now that you know um, design ground motions can continue to increase. Um, and we're often designing for motions where we run into these problems with the limit equilibrium methods. So what we'll do now, what I'm gonna do now is go through our proposed methodology um, I'll try and keep it brief. I'm not going to um, go through every little detail of every equation, but I wanted to just kind of explain the motivation behind what we're doing so that some of the equations make sense in that context. So first, we're going to use elastodynamic solutions just to derive an expression for the Winkler stiffness intensity. So that's a relationship between relative displacement between the, um, the soil in the free field and the wall. Um, and from that relative displacement, you can then compute a pressure, right? And the Winkler assumption is, is technically wrong, but it's pretty useful. And so we'll use it here just to facilitate um, these approximate elastic solutions. And then what we do is utilize the ground surface motion representative of the actual site conditions instead of assuming a rigid base. So we have our Winkler stiffness intensity now from the elastodynamic solutions we put those springs on the wall. Actually, we don't even put springs, it's an analytical solution. But um, then we put a motion into those springs that comes from a separate analysis, all right, that's uh, more consistent with site conditions. And then we solve the equilibrium problem uh, using a weak form solution, considering wall flexibility and so soil and homogeneity. And uh, the result is still pretty complicated. And um, I recognize that it's not going to be used in its existing form or coded up by very many people. Although we have a code, you can use it, it's freely available. And it, if you put in a ground surface motion and some wall properties, it will compute the pressures for you. But we also have a simplified solution and it's in a methodology that's really well suited for routine use and engineering design. And I'll briefly present that toward the end as well. All right, so a little bit about our SSI assumptions. Um, what we do is conceptualize soil structure interaction as consisting of kinematic and inertial components. And that inherently assumes superposition, so it's only valid for linear systems, uh, but it still is a very useful concept to divide these, these different interaction mechanisms up. So kinematic soil structure interaction arises from differences in displacement between the soil and the structure it's interacting with. There's no external inertial forces, so nothing is connected to the wall, pushing it into the soil. And all of the deformation, uh, all of the pressure arises from differential movement between the wall and the free field soil. As I mentioned before, if you dig out the soil and replace it with a wall system that has the exact same mass and stiffness, you don't get any earth pressures, right? Because they can move together. It's really that relative movement that creates pressure. And um, the probably the most powerful concept in kinematic soil structure interaction is the ratio between the wavelength and the structure size. So if the wavelength is really long, you don't get very much interaction at all because the structure just kind of moves along with the ground. So what's shown here is actually a fairly short wavelength. We drew it this way just to facilitate the, uh, the diagram. But you know, if you have a long, a pretty long wavelength, the soil displacement profile is nearly vertical up here near the surface. Therefore, if, if the wall is vertical, there's not a lot of interaction and you don't get a lot of pressure. And recall those diagrams that Professor Sitar was showing, you know, his walls were kind of floating in sand or clay and there was, the base was way down here. So you might get something that's kind of like this wavelength and that explains why you get lower pressures. 
um, the relative displacement between the base of the wall. The, well, the foundation input motion is, is the motion of the, the base slab here in the absence of any inertia. It tends to be exactly equal to the surface motion because this is a vertical line. And then the rotation of the system is zero and you get negligible wall pressures as a result. On the other hand, if you have high frequency motion or alternatively a very uh, deep wall or soft soil, you get short wavelengths. And the short wavelengths cause a lot of interaction because the wall simply can't deform that way. And so because of that relative displacement, you get big earth pressures being imposed on the wall. You get a difference between the foundation input motion. It's generally less than the ground surface motion. And uh, you get some rotation now because those pressures are causing the structure to rotate and you get the potential for large earth pressures, kind of like what we see in the elastodynamic solutions with a rigid base. All right, and then there's always inertial interaction as well. And that's where components, structural components that are above ground that are attached to the, to the wall system may introduce additional loads in here uh, that, that drive earth pressures as well. And um, those loads on the wall, those earth pressures are also actually driven by relative displacement between the soil and the wall. It's just that now the, the forcing function that's causing those relative displacements is coming from inertia of the structure. And there's also inertia of the wall itself. We're often designing basement walls to be pretty thick these days. So they have their own inertia and that's a, it's an important contribution. And I'll show you that um, later on. Um, a key issue here for structural inertia forces is, is what are the details of how the structure is connected? A lot of the time, the structure is not directly connected to the wall elements. And, and this is a diagram from uh, Professor Maley at UC Berkeley that illustrates that. Here you have a tall building with a core wall um, structure in the middle connected to a mat foundation. And then the retaining walls are you know, off over here or over here. And in this case, the loads from the structure are going into the mat foundation and down into the ground, and they're not directly connected to the wall. Although you could imagine a case where there is a structural wall connected to the retaining wall, and that might drive additional inertia into the retaining wall system. So both kinematic and inertial effects give rise to seismic earth pressures. Both produce pressures as a result of relative movements between wall and soil. And uh, both are pretty much ignored in limit equilibrium methods, right? We don't include inertial loading of wall when we do a Mononobe Okabe analysis. We don't typically worry about relative displacements at all when we do Mononobe Okabe. So here's our, our proposed Winkler solution. We have a, um, well, first, the, the waves are vertically propagating shear waves. So we're not solving this problem for Rayleigh waves or inclined waves or anything like that. Um, the surface displacement amplitude is called UG0, and the frequency is lowercase f. And then we assume that the retained soil is a vertically, homogene vertically inhomogeneous elastic continuum. So the shear wave velocity profile increases with depth in accordance with the power function given up here. So this is a pretty, pretty standard um, shape of a shear wave velocity profile. And uh, its height is h and length is l. And L could be infinity too. You can have an infinitely long backfill or a finite length backfill between two identical walls. And then the walls are modeled as elastic Euler Bernoulli plates. So they go infinitely into and out of the plane of the problem. And the top and bottom are constrained by string uh, springs that um, reflect um, SSI effects at the foundation level down here at the bottom or of other structural components that are attached to the top of the wall that might constrain rotations or displacements up there. All right, so now we'll walk through all of the different pieces of this. So first, um, let's see, all right, if we, if we had that inhomogeneous soil profile, there are solutions that give us the display shape of the soil for that profile um, by Rovithis, and his colleagues, a paper back in 2011. And what he found is that for that particular formulation of inhomogeneous soil, the solution for the displacement can be represented by this um, combination of Bessel functions. And um, the Bessel functions just depend on basically the, the shear wave velocity profile parameters. So you have VH, which is the shear wave velocity at the elevation of the bottom of the wall. This B parameter controls how big is the shear wave velocity right at the surface. 
usually we don't have it go to zero. Um, if you look at a normal shear wave velocity profile, it doesn't really go to zero at the top, most of, unless you're maybe at the beach or something where it's totally uncemented, clean sand. Um, and then we have this exponent in that controls sort of the, the shape of that curve as it goes down. So um, this equation is a little bit ugly. Maybe we're not totally used to coding up vessel functions, but it, it's not that bad. You can come up with these shapes right here. So n equals 0 0.01. This is practically homogeneous, right? So that's like a cosine function right there. And then 0.9 is almost linear. Linearly varying shear modulus is highly inhomogeneous, and you get that kind of shape instead. So these, these different shapes are important because we're modeling the um, earth pressure as arising from relative displacement between the soil and the wall. So the inhomogeneity becomes important in that context. Uh, and then to derive the Winkler stiffness intensity, we did these elastodynamic solutions and they're not 100% um, rigorous. We're assuming that there's no change in vertical pressure in order, due to the earthquake shaking in order to facilitate a, a, a close form analytical solution to this problem. Um, and then we use uh, the Bessel function solution for the free field displacement or for the displacement profile here in the middle of the wall. And uh, I won't go through all the details here, but you, we can end up with this expression down here for the um, earth pressure at position zero in the Y direction. So right at, right at the wall face. And then it's just a function of depth and some other parameters. Um, and I'm not even defining all of the parameters here, but you can take a look at this paper and see that derivation if you're interested in those details. And once you have the pressure, then you can just divide by the uh, free field soil displacement profile. So that's UG at Y equals infinity. So we're looking at the pressure at Y equals zero divided by the soil displacement at Y equals infinity, which is the displacement that would exist without the presence of the wall there at all. And then um, we model it like this. The, the KYIH is the Winkler stiffness intensity at the base of the wall. And we multiply it by this function of depth um, where the function of depth is basically the same as the shear wave velocity function, with the only difference that being that now we have a two in up here in the power. Um, and the, the reason we do that is that um, the Winkler stiffness intensity is proportional to shear modulus, and shear modulus is proportional to the square of shear wave velocity. So you have to have a two up there. And then we have this approximate equation here that's done by regression. And this is the, um, the static Winkler stiffness intensity at the bottom of the wall. And it's just a function of the shear modulus at the bottom of the wall, the wall height, Poisson ratio, and then these other parameters that control the inhomogeneity. And then we multiply those by correction factors to account for the effects of frequency, wall flexibility, and the length of the deposit. So there's three correction factors that have to be added on. Um, the frequency correction is is added on to model propagation of waves through the retained soil. So this is like a soil inertia effect term. Um, and that influences the Winkler stiffness intensity. So we have, uh, here's the dimensionless frequency, omega h over vh. And then we have a first mode uh, dimensionless frequency down here, which for a finite length system is um, given by this expression here, where this, this a naught c is for an infinite length deposit. So the, the finite length deposit tends to stiffen the system a little bit because the walls are both there and providing support to the soil. Uh, but anyway, you could, e you could easily compute this frequency multiplier there. Then we have a wall flexibility correction factor. Um, and we have that because if the wall rotates, it, it produces shear stresses on the soil and those tend to stiffen the, uh, the Winkler stiffness parameter. And then there's the deposit length correction factor. And there's really two factors here. One is that the presence of opposing walls tends to stiffen the soil response. And the other one is that the, there's no such thing as a free field motion anymore, right? The motion is somehow influenced by both walls. And so the reference condition is in the middle and it's not really a free field, it's a little bit less than that, which makes the uh, Winkler stiffness a little bit higher. All right, and then we have impedance functions at the top and bottom of the wall. We just use uh, classical literature for the, the functions at the bottom. And then the ones at the top are based on structural stiffness that's not explicitly modeled here in our, in our model. 
And then we have mass too. So there's um, a mass density and thickness and then a flexural stiffness of the wall. So we end up with this governing differential equation, the, the famous Winkler equation where you have the um, second derivative of curvature or the fourth derivative of displacement here multiplied or minus this uh, KYI HFZ. So that's the Winkler stiffness intensity multiplied by relative displacement. And then this one is the wall inertia term. And that's all equal to zero. And uh, this differential equation doesn't have an exact analytical solution. So we uh, solve it using a weak form approximation where we integrate from zero to H and multiply by a basis function or trial function. And then we also have a test function. We use Hermite cubic polynomial shape functions for that. And these functions are, are actually a pretty good approximation for reasonably stiff walls. If you had a really flexible wall, this it wouldn't follow this, this, this displacement very well, but these work pretty well for typical wall systems that we design. So here, this is the slide with all the equations. <laughs> anyway, we, um, we do integration by parts and end up with this sort of long expression with all these integrals. But it's easy to lump these together into force vector, stiffness matrix terms, and a mass matrix term. And then uh, each component is given by these more detailed equations. So you may recognize this one up here at the top. This is just the, uh, uh, the elastic beam stiffness equation right, for an Euler Bernoulli plate. Um, then this expression here is not integrable, so we have to integrate it um, numerically, like using trapezoidal integration. This one is integrable. It's a long expression that's a series here, and it becomes a little numerically unstable, so we end up just doing trapezoidal integration on that too. But um, pretty easy to set up these matrices and solve for the C sub i values, which are the displacement coefficients that we have to multiply our shape functions by to get the wall displacement approximation. So the steps to the solution is that first we start out with the ground surface motion and compute the Fourier transform of that motion. And then for each component of that surface motion, we compute stiffness and mass matrices and force vectors and solve for the displacement coefficients. And there's a separate set of displacement coefficients for each frequency component. And there's four terms in each um, displacement coefficient corresponding to the displacement and rotation at the top and bottom of the wall. And then we can compute the reaction forces and do the inverse Fourier transform to get the uh, reaction at the top and bottom. So that's all of the shear and moments at the top and bottom of the wall. And then at the time of the peak bending moment, which is really what we worry about when we design walls, um, we can calculate the soil and wall displacement at some number of points along the height of the wall and then do some numerical integration to get earth pressures um, and shear moment diagrams. And then um, recognizing that this is kind of complicated to implement, we have published a, a notebook. This is a, a screenshot of a Jupyter notebook that uses Python to compute these solutions. And this is publicly available in DesignSafe. So if you go to designsafe-ci.org, you can look in the published projects location, find this project. And if you click on one of these two Jupyter notebooks with the IPI and B extension, there will be an option for you to open it in Jupyter and you can run it and change the input parameters and play around with it yourself. So um, I'm gonna get on with the data here soon. I have about 10 minutes left, but first to validate this, we did a, uh, an analysis of a, a system that has an exact solution. So with uniform soil and a flexible wall, we do have this exact Winkler solution. And um, the comparison here just shows that our our shape functions actually work pretty well. This is the displacement profiles. These are um, pressure distributions. And um, this beta naught times H, basically 0 0.5 is a pretty rigid wall, two is a pretty flexible wall. And you can see that the moment distributions, which is really what we care about, you can't hardly see a difference between the solid lines and the dotted lines. So the approximate solution we've developed works pretty well for this problem. Then we also compared with Yunnan and Valetzos for flexible walls. And what you see here is our proposed solution with dashed lines and the Yunnan and Valetzos solutions with solid lines. Now they're including many more mode shapes than we are. So our solution is simpler than theirs. And you, you, we don't get the exact same thing for sure. Um, 
And if you simplify it here to look at the seismic earth pressure, we tend to underpredict seismic earth pressure compared to their solution, but we overpredict the line of action of that seismic earth pressure. And as a result of those sort of combined differences, we get the uh, moments almost exactly the same as their solution. All right, now on to this um, centrifuge modeling program. This is by Hushmand et al. He was um, one of Shade Dashti's PhD students. And they did a bunch of tests on the University of Colorado Boulder centrifuge consisting of these um, buried structures that were fairly stiff. They had uh, diaphragms across the top and bottom that provided some flexural stiffness to the walls. And they put tactile pressure sensors on the outside. So this is a very nice data set. Um, Shade and her colleagues did a great job with these tests, in my opinion, and, and strain gauges here too, to measure bending moments. Um, and then th these are some of the results. So this is a, a, a Northridge, um, a, a ground motion that was recorded during the North, Northridge earthquake. Th I didn't put the shaking intensity, but this one is not a, a super strong motion. Um, they definitely shook with, with stronger motions later in the test sequence. And what I'm plotting here are displacements. So the solid lines are predictions. Um, this is our prediction of the wall displacement and the soil displacement at the time that the peak bending moment was, was predicted in the wall. Um, and now in this one, we're comparing predictions with some measurements. So the green dots are the tactile pressure sensor measurements and the blue line is our predicted earth pressure diagram. So they don't agree perfectly well. The green dots are a little higher up here and a little lower down there, but they also don't agree very well with the Mononobu Okabe method shown in orange or the Seed and Whitman method there shown in green. And this is the bending moment diagram. So this is really what we care the most about. You can see that our prediction is slightly under predicting the peak bending moment, which happens down here at the bottom of the wall. Uh, but we're actually predicting higher moments than the Mononobu Okabe or Seed and Whitman solutions uh, for this particular wall. And that's driven in part by the fact that there was wall inertia that's included in our solution and not in those limit equilibrium methods. Then when we go to a stronger um, motion, now um, we're you know, under predicting the earth pressure diagram a little bit. The bending moments are predicted pretty accurately, actually at depth. Um, Seed and Whitman is still under predicting a bit down here where the bending moments are biggest. And there's no Mononobu Okabe line here because the ground shaking intensity was too strong and the Mononobu Okabe solution provides a physically meaningless result. So we can't plot for that particular motion. So we repeated this for all of the tests that they did. And this is a plot of residuals. So this is the natural log of the, um, the peak measured bending moment, at, which is the, the one, you know, at the location of the, the lowest strain gauge on the wall, minus the corresponding natural log of the predicted bending moment. And the mean value is 0.11, which means that we're slightly under predicting on average the bending moments from these tests. And the standard deviation is 0.34. So there's definitely dispersion. This is geotechnical engineering after all. If we predicted perfectly, nobody would ever believe it. And for comparison, here's the Mononobu Okabe results. So it tends to under predict at low PGA, and then all of a sudden it predicts some kind of uh, physically meaningless solution or an infinite earth pressure, depending on your interpretation of those equations. And the Seed and Whitman equations tend to under predict, in this case, kind of at all PGA levels. So it's, it's systematically biased low. And um, I wanna to touch briefly on the influence of inertial interaction. So um, we could repeat our simulation uh, or our solution, but without any wall mass. And it's easy to do that in our code. And, and in that case, you would get the orange line instead of the blue line. So it changes the distribution and the uh, amplitude of the earth pressure. And in this case, you would, you would predict a lower bending moment. So the inertia of the wall has a tendency to increase bending moments in this case. And that's why our predictions were more accurate than the limit equilibrium is that those don't include inertia. Now, if you go in and add the inertia afterward, right, the structural engineers would really not like this because now we're in not only imposing a huge earth pressure, but asking them to also include wall inertia. Um, th that's what it looks like here. So with no inertia, uh, the 
um, Mononobi Okabe solution gets to be a little bit higher, you know, higher residuals, seed and women gets um, to be lower. Oh, sorry, with inertia, the residuals get lower down here and seed and Whitman actually becomes fairly accurate, although it's, it's over predicting on average just a little bit. And if you take inertia out of our solution, our prediction gets worse, right? We uh, under predict by an amount that's similar to what the seed and Whitman solution does without inertia. All right, with just the remaining two minutes that I have, I wanna walk you through this kind of simplified procedure that we've formulated. It's in this um, uh, part three resource paper in the NEHOP recommended seismic provisions um, right here, causes of seismic earth pressures. And so what we did was, was took our solution and thought, how can we simplify this so that a design office could do it? So we came up with a fairly simple earth pressure function of normalized wavelength. So lambda over H, that critical kinematic cons um, consideration. And it's a really simple equation, right? It's just a sine and a cosine and then a, a KH. So a shear wave velocity and a frequency there for K. Uh, and then the normalized resultant height is given here. And we thought, well, yeah, but now you have to correct it for wall flexibility. So we came up with a wall flexibility correction factor, pretty simple equations here as well. And uh, you can go and get this resource paper if you'd like to see the details of it. Um, and then there's also ground motion representation. So we don't have a time series. Oftentimes we have a PGA value and maybe some site period. So we're using those kind of parameters here. You get the mean period of the ground motion, which is magnitude dependent. And you can approximate the uh, UG zero based on the peak ground velocity, which is also predictable using a ground motion model or ground motion prediction equation. And uh, Ellen Ratchie and her colleagues had a paper in 2004 on mean period that we're using. And when you, you do that, you get, um, even though there's a lot of simplifying assumptions, the residuals are pretty good, right? There's unbiased, maybe a little bit of positive, uh, this would be a little bit of overprediction bias in this case. And this is using the small strain shear wave velocity. If we use a strain compatible shear wave velocity, like an equivalent linear solution, that has the effect of decreasing the normalized wavelength because the soil gets softer. And um, it, it does have a little bit of a negative impact on the residual. So we actually get a more accurate solution with the small strain shear wave velocity. And then the Mononobe Okabe and um, those solutions are shown here. And I'm gonna skip over that for the sake of time. So in conclusion, the Mononobi Okabe solution and its variants are really the current standard of practice for computing seismic earth pressures, but they fail to provide a physically meaningful solution at high shaking levels and they ignore soil structure interaction, which we know to be important. Um, elastodynamic solutions use boundary conditions, including a fixed base assumption that are unrealistic. So they often overpredict seismic earth pressures as a result. Although in the case that I showed today, they actually underpredict because they also fail to consider the impact of wall inertia. Um, and the proposed Winkler solution overcomes several of these limitations. There are assumptions, of course, but it overcomes several of these limitations and, and provided reasonable comparisons with some experimental data. So it doesn't address all the possible issues, some additional aspects or gapping at the soil wall interface. Um, that's a geometric nonlinearity. Um, soil plasticity, right? There can definitely be soil failure. It's only indirectly captured using an equivalent linear approach here. Um, there's coupling of soil and water in saturated or partially saturated fills, including the possibility of liquefaction. And then there could also be nonlinear behavior in the structural elements of the wall. None of those things are captured in the solution we're using. Um, furthermore, inertial interaction from above ground components are not explicitly modeled here, though incorporating that is pretty feasible given our formulation. So here's a list of references, and I think I will um, end there and welcome any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Brendenberg, for an excellent lecture and uh, finishing in time. So thank you for that also. <laughs> I think I was two minutes long, so, but close enough. <laughs> so I'm sure that uh, all of you will appreciate the efforts of Professor Vandenberg. Uh, he has highlighted the mismatch between the earth pressure and reality, and he has proposed uh, a solution. And uh, uh, 
uh, which gives the importance for the inertial interaction. So with these words, I request my co-chair, uh, Professor uh, Darren, to take question answer and start discussion. Hello, hi, Professor Brandon Burke. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the very, uh, uh, for the detailed um, uh, talk. Uh, and I like best about, um, you spoke about the, about the theoretical solutions and how they align with, with the experimental and field data, which is uh, indeed very, uh, uh, very uh, refreshing. Um, so let me start off with the first questions um, that we have received. Um, the first question uh, is as follows. From a philosophical perspective, limit equilibrium and limit analysis methods correspond to strength limit state where the soil is on the verge of failure. How do you justify using an elastic solution to represent strength limit state? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And you know, I did acknowledge at the end that soil plasticity would have some impact on this that we're not including here. But you know, what I will say is that um, a lot of the time, if you look at, at some of these solutions, the shear strains in terms of like a deviatoric invariant strain behind the wall is actually smaller than in the free field. <laughs> so um, the, the pressures can, can occur even in systems that are not even close to a limit state. Um, and I recognize that a lot of time you may have a preformed active wedge. If you have a retaining wall that's allowed to move quite a bit, you know, you may form an active wedge or the soil might be close to a state of failure, but we don't really design retaining walls to be in a state of failure. We design them to have some factor of safety. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that this truly is a limit state problem necessarily. I think that you should check the solution that um, that comes out to see if you're predicting a significant amount of soil plasticity. And in that case, maybe the um, limit state analysis would be warranted. But I, I think there's an aspect of it where that should be a, a that should be a check that you perform. But maybe the elastic solutions are useful for approximating what the demand is going to be. I, I think you're not going to reach a limit state a lot of the time. Thank you so much for the uh, for the explanations. Um, well, I do have a question uh, where, where it could be covered uh, in your talk, uh, but I perhaps that I haven't quite really uh, kind of uh, uh, to pick it up. Um, so, just want to find out uh, for the proposed uh, solutions um, uh, in your example, you know, that you showed about somewhat like a more uniform soil profile. So, I'm just wondering for for this same method, uh, how is it able to be able uh, to accommodate for layered soils of different C and phi values? Oh, that's a great question. This one is continuously inhomogeneous. So there's no kind of discontinuity, no layering. Um, the layering problem actually from a dynamic perspective gets to be a bit complicated because the, you know, the waves are propagating at different speeds and so forth. I think conceivably you could construct static Winkler springs for that kind of layered profile, but that gets to be a complicated problem. We were thinking more of the kind of walls where a backfill is compacted behind it and it's fairly uniform. But you know, for excavation support systems, you may very well have different soil types that are being supported and that's, a, that's more complicated than what we can do with this solution. Um, well, but anyway, I, I do see that there is already a huge uh, improvement to what we traditionally do um, based on your proposed method. So, yeah, so we're very grateful for your sharing. Um, right, thank you. So if anyone has, um, has, has any further questions, uh, please feel free to drop them uh, in the Q&A uh, box. Um, uh, Dr. Darren, if there are no yes. questions, can I just add? Just I think there are no questions from others from mm -hmm. QA. Can I can I can yes. I ask? Can yeah, I ask yes. a question? Oh yes, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Professor Scott, uh, thanks for excellent uh, presentation. It's very illustrative and comprehensive. I uh, just uh, wondering, uh, you uh, told you have taken care of the nonlinearity of the soil. 
you uh, by means of equivalent uh, linear analysis so is it uh, uh, based on only free field analysis or is it uh, based on the combined effect of wall and soil system because free field analysis like as you mentioned the movements are going to be different am i right so accordingly the stiffness and strength may be different so i'm just wanting to know yeah it you're right it's a it's a fairly complicated problem just to do the equivalent linear analysis because the strain field is variable not only vertically but horizontally too you tend to get smaller shear strains behind the wall than in the free field so this was a free field analysis and we kind of approximated an average strain over the height of the soil layer. So there was a lot of arm waving there. And um, doing the, the equivalent linear approach actually has two effects that kind of counterbalance each other. One of them is that the Winkler springs become softer because now the elastic material is softer. And the second one is that the wavelength becomes shorter. So now you get higher earth pressures, you know, higher relative displacements. So you get a weaker spring or a, a softer spring, but higher displacement. And the resulting pressures don't change that much. So it doesn't have a big impact on the, on the outcome. Okay, one, one, one another small query. Uh, have you considered effect of the phase effects? I think you are analyzing uh, in frequency domain. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 I, like, if I understood, I'm not sure. Uh, but in that case, how you are accounting for the phase differences? Between the yeah, we're, we're not accounting for them all that well. So we're using a first mode shape function for the soil displacement profile. And so the, the phasing effects that would really become important at high frequencies aren't modeled in our approach. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Sure. So if there are no questions, then can we move to the second lecture? Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Vandenberg. Uh, now, uh, uh, there is a second plenary lecture. Uh, it will be delivered by uh, Professor uh, Kyle Rollins. Uh, the topic of the lecture is liquefaction induced pile down drag from full scale testing. So before uh, he starts his lecture, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Rollins. Uh, Professor Rollins received his BS degree from uh, Brigham Young University and his PhD from University of California at Berkeley. After working as a geotechnical consultant, he joined the civil engineering faculty at BYU in 1987, following after his father, who was previously a geotechnical uh, professor. So in the same department, his research has involved geotechnical earthquake engineering, deep foundation behavior, bridge abutment behavior, collapsible soils, and soil improvement techniques. ASC has re recognized his work with the Hoover Research Award, the Wellington Prize, and the Wallace Hayward Baker Award. In 2009, he was the Cross Canada Geotechnical Lecturer for the Canadian Geotechnical Society, and he received uh, George uh, Osterberg Award from, from the Deep Foundation Institute in 2014. So with this brief uh, introduction, I request uh, Professor uh, Rollins to uh, deliver his keynote lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm getting a message that I can't share my screen until the other participant is stopped. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Rohit, can you please hello? Okay. All right, uh, good morning. I'm, um, this is a photograph of my campus in uh, the Rocky Mountains in, in the United States, but I'm actually in Italy this morning uh, preparing for another uh, large-scale blast liquefaction test. Uh, Brigham Young University is one of the two largest private universities in the United States. Uh, this is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are right up against the mountain front here, which was formed by normal faulting. 
about 80% of our population lives within 20 kilometers of the earthquake fault. So seismic issues are a, are a matter of life and death, uh, a very important issue for uh, our, our area. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about one aspect of that, and that's uh, down drag and drag load behavior of piles from uh, large scale blast induced uh, liquefaction tests. I'm uh, grateful to be invited to make this presentation. Uh, I'd hoped to be able to return to India and do this, but uh, we'll have to wait for a little better times and this is the next best uh, solution. Uh, this uh, research has been sponsored by a number of organizations, including the National Science Foundation in the United States, uh, different state departments of transportation and uh, private consulting companies. We're grateful for all their support. If we uh, have a soft soil profile, uh, many times we support structural loads by using board piles or driven piles. And this axial force from the structural uh, system, P, can be resisted by the side friction, Q sub S, along the length of the pile, and then end bearing, which we'll call Q sub B. If we look at the load in the pile as a result of that um, applied load, we'll start out the surface with that applied load P. And then as we go deeper into the ground, the load will be transferred to the soil by side friction. And then we'll have some end bearing at the base Q sub B. So I'll be showing the load in the pile in a number of diagrams. So I was wanting to make sure you understood this. So we can, any anytime we develop load, we have some settlement that occurs and at the toe of the pile, we're gonna plot the end bearing resistance or the toe resistance QB as a function of settlement. So to develop that resistance, we'll have say this amount of settlement. Now, if we have a condition where there is some earthquake shaking, uh, we may have a situation where this loose or medium sand, medium dense sand could liquefy and lose a lot of its strength. At that point, the, the side friction in the liquefied zone might be very low, and many people assume that it's essentially zero. That causes uh, the load to be transferred further down into the pile uh, and have more end bearing resistance develop. Now, as the soil reconsolidates and dissipates pore water pressure, you have the soil moving downward relative to the pile and you actually develop negative friction or this is sometimes referred to as drag load. Uh, so we have to account for this as well. Now below that um, zone where we have down drag, many people still assume that, that the side friction is zero in the liquefied zone which leads to additional settlement from the higher end bearing resistance at the bottom of the pile. But uh, in reality, the only way the soil can settle and develop negative friction is if the excess pore pressures dissipate. And when the pore pressures dissipate, this can lead to a down drag even in the liquefied zone. Now, if that's the case, if we have down drag in the liquefied zone, then we'll experience even more settlement that might not be accounted for if we uh, assume that the side friction in the liquefied soil is zero. Now you can see that uh, the neutral plane is the point where we have the maximum load in the pile, which would be important for structural design. Above the neutral plane, we have negative friction. Below it, we have positive friction. And we can also look at this in terms of settlement. Uh, we, here I'm plotting the settlement of the soil due to liquefaction in the liquefied zone. And then I'm going to also plot the settlement of the pile. And the neutral plane would be the location where the settlement of the pile is equal to the settlement of the soil. Now, does this uh, ever cause problems? Well, yes, it has caused problems in, in past earthquakes. Uh, this is a one case uh, history was from the Resurrection River in Alaska during the 
this magnitude 9.2 Alaska earthquake in 1964, where a down drag in gravelly soils that liquefied actually pulled the piles out of the pile cap. Another case history is the Juan Pablo Secundo Bridge in Concepcion, Chile, where uh, investigations showed that down drag uh, facilitated settlement of this pier here that uh, was uh, on the order of 50 to or half a meter uh, of settlement. Uh, this is a slide from the uh, gear team that I participated with in Chile. So some of our research in interests are to measure the development of, of negative skin friction during liquefaction and reconsolidation, to determine the skin friction in the liquefied sand, to determine the skin friction in the non-liquefied soil above and below it, and to see if this neutral plane concept that I've described really uh, does, uh, can account for the, the pile settlement and the soil behavior. So I'm gonna describe several case histories where we've performed testing of this to investigate these components. And then if uh, time permits, uh, sketch out an outline of how this could be evaluated. Our philosophy is that one good test is worth a thousand expert opinions. Uh, this is said by Werner von Braun, the designer of the Saturn V moon rocket. And this doesn't mean that we're opposed to being experts. We all wanna be experts. That's why we come to seminars like this. We think it's important uh, to know the latest developments. But what it does mean is that we need to know how the earth really works. And once we've got ground truth information, you might say, then you can adjust your numerical models like uh, Professor Brandenburg just discussed so that they actually do match what uh, we see in reality. But not all tests are of equal value. Uh, Einstein once said a theory is something nobody believes except the person who proposed it. And he had a lot of experience with theories. And an experiment or a test is something that everybody believes except the person who performed it. And this is, maybe you've had some tests like this yourself where you're not quite certain that everything was done correctly and the result is uh, exactly as it should be. So we have to look skeptically at, at what's done and, and see if it makes sense. So how could we investigate this down drag problem? Well, we could use a large scale testing in the laboratory. We could use small centrifuge models which can be used successfully. We can use this large laminar shear box that I used at the University at Buffalo. But in this case, we have to construct the sand and it may be different than what's going on in uh, reality in a natural soil deposit. If we move out to large scale field testing, we could go investigate sites in highly seismic areas and maybe we get lucky and have a site that was instrumented where we could have, the, have everything measured during an earthquake. This might take 10 or 20 years to get a result. We could also use vibrosized trucks like Professor Stokey uses, but this uh, has its limits as well. And we can only test a very small volume close to the surface. So our approach has been to use controlled blasting uh, to investigate this problem. I should point out that no method is perfect. We learn a lot from each method. They all contribute to helping us understand the whole the behavior. So each piece provides a, a one piece of the puzzle uh, to help us understand the situation. First time we used this was the idea was, was at Treasure Island in San Francisco where we detonate small explosive charges in the ground and then that uh, induces excess pore pressures so that the soil liquefies and then we can test features inside like in this case piles loaded laterally in, in liquefied soil. The advantages here are that we can test at full scale. We have the native soil in situ with the real microstructure and aging that's involved. We can liquefy very large volumes at one time to investigate system performance, which I'll describe uh, in New Zealand here in a little while. And we can also liquefy soils to depths of 10 to 20 meters. Uh, we've also found that we can produce settlement that's very similar to earthquake induced values as I'll show later on. But there are limitations of course as with any method. 
The mechanism of core pressure generation is not identical to an earthquake, and we need to do more research to help understand this. There's components of compression, but we think largely the core pressures are developed by shear strains. We must avoid large vibrations and disturbance to adjacent uh, structures and people. And this uh, full-scale testing is more expensive than small-scale tests. Uh, nevertheless, we've had an opportunity to, to do these tests at four different sites uh, in Vancouver, British in Canada. We did tests on driven piles at 32 centimeter diameter. In Christchurch, we did tests on 60 centimeter auger cast piles. In Italy, uh, five years ago, we did tests on micro piles. And in Arkansas with uh, Professor Kaufman, we did tests on 45 centimeter driven piles and 1.2 meter drilled shafts. This, uh, and so I'm gonna talk about these sites. The, the Vancouver site, you, you can see Vancouver in the distance in this photograph. Uh, these can see the river, the road leading into Vancouver. Um, if you're a structural engineer, you probably think that you ought to have a, a, a bridge structure here, but this is a path is covered by a, a tunnel at, at the present time. Uh, and we received uh, authorization to use the Canada, Canada liquefaction experiment site for these down drag tests. This site consists of uh, a soil profile with uh, primarily of sand with some non-liquefiable soil that's uh, silty at the top. Uh, the relative density is about 40% and it's very uniform with depth. And our pile extends from the ground surface to a depth of about 21 meters. The SPT N160 value is about 10 in the target zone for liquefaction, which is from maybe five to 13 meters. And it's 17 near the tip of the pile. They, they got these values uh, uh, from field testing. Now, uh, our idea was to put a test pile in place with uh, four reaction piles to set off these explosive charges, to measure the excess pore pressures that were developed with pore pressure transducers, and to measure the strain that developed in the pile uh, with those triangular strain gauges. Uh, we applied load that's equal to one half of the ultimate capacity of the pile uh, prior to loading uh, or prior to the blast test. Uh, to monitor the settlement of the soil, we used a Sondex settlement pipe. Uh, so we have a corrugated pipe with um, rings, metallic rings, and the soil or the pipe settles with the ground. And then from this access, Point, we can see where the, where the soil has moved and gives us a nice profile of settlement versus depth. So this is a, a, a indication or a, a video of the- Yeah, yeah go! go. That, um, that pipe settled on its own weight about, uh, about 30 to 40 centimeters uh, just as the soil liquefied. Now you probably heard as soon as the explosives started detonating that um, the reaction piles moved up a little bit and reduced the, the load on the test pile. And that reduction was about 160 kilonewtons and we turned on the pumps to reapply that 160 kilonewtons of force uh, to the test pile. And we'll see the result of that here in a minute. Uh, we monitored the excess pore pressure ratio, RU and RU value of one indicates liquefaction. And in that zone from six meters to about 13 meters, we're getting excess pore pressure ratios between 0.9 and one indicating that the soil is essentially liquefied in this zone. But down at the tip of the pile, the toe of the pile, 
the excess pore pressures are um, less than about 15%. The pore pressure is dissipated from the bottom upwards, which is uh, typical of what we see, but it took about 17 minutes for that excess pore pressure to go back down to zero uh, or down to 10% of the um, uh, static value. Uh, this is a, a poor man's uh, video of uh, the settlement of the ground around the test pile as those charges detonate the soil liquefied and then settled. So this is 10 minutes uh, after the blast took place. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the head of the, to the top of the pile before liquefaction. And here's the plot after liquefaction. We had about 27 centimeters of ground settlement, which represents a volumetric strain of about 3%. It's a very uh, unusual experience. When I ran out to watch this, I um, saw that it, it looked like, I'm, I'm so used to the ground being stable that it looked like the pile was moving upward out of the ground, but it was the soil settling. Uh, so within the zone of liquefied soil, we're seeing relatively uh, consistent settlement versus depth, increase in settlement versus depth. Uh, we had a little slippage at one point, but we're uh, thinking that uh, the Sondex tube represents that settlement over the interval. And the top layer of soil that was above the water table is essentially going down with the surrounding soil. So their measured settlement of 270 millimeters was about the, at the ground surface was about what the Sondex was recording. How does that compare with what you would expect from an earthquake event? Uh, there's a number of people that proposed techniques. Uh, Tokimatsu and Seed uh, suggested for a blow count of 10 that you'd expect volumetric strain of about two and a half percent. Yoshimi and uh, Ishihara suggest for that value you might uh, expect volumetric strain of three and a half percent. And we're, we're, we're measuring a, a volumetric stra strain of about three percent. So it's very right it within the range of what you would expect for settlements in liquefied soil. All right, um, the blue curve shown here is the load in the pile just before blasting. And I, I told you that soon after blasting, we lost load and we had to reapply that load again. And as we reapplied that load, which was 160 kilonewtons, we reapplied a positive, fric positive friction. Normally we'd expect negative friction to develop and go downward from the ground surface. Uh, but let's focus on the liquefied zone here. So again, blue is the uh, load in the pile uh, versus depth prior to liquefaction. liquefaction. And in that zone, we had about 180 kilonewtons of resistance. Just after blasting, the curve is very almost vertical, so we're having very little resistance, which is what we'd expect in liquefied soil. And, but at the end of settlement, we're seeing uh, negative friction that's equal to about 90 kilonewtons on average, which is about half of the positive skin friction value that we had prior to liquefaction. All right, well, it's, it's hard to build a uh, design method based on one test pile, but that's one data point. So what's going on here? Um, conceptually, let's look at this. The static loading before liquefaction, can, we, can, with the, we can estimate the side friction as being equal to K times the tangent of the interface friction times the vertical effective stress times the area of the shaft. And if we take K times tan delta as beta, we'd have beta times the vertical effective stress times uh, area of the shaft. So we just have static water pressure here. Immediately after liquefaction, the excess pore pressure becomes equal to the vertical effective stress and our uh, skin friction goes close to zero. So we could approximate that by saying our beta would be equal to zero relative to the initial vertical effective stress. During reconsolidation, 
the excess pore pressure is decreasing to zero. And as it does that, and effective stress increases, we start to see negative friction developing. So the soil can grab onto the pile and cause it to move downward. So in our case, that beta for this situation would be about 50% of the beta before liquefaction. Now, one open question is what happens long-term if you were to reload that pile, would you get the same skin friction you had before? And that's one thing we're investigating in our blast test that will take place this Friday here in Italy. Um, from the centrifuge tests, uh, Kanapa and uh, Matabushi did measurements and um, they had a different system, so they didn't have exactly the same load displacement uh, profile as, uh, as we did, but they report that they had uh, negative skin friction values, which were very similar to what uh, we reported in our study in 2006. Uh, then along came the Christchurch, New Zealand earthquake with this iconic photograph of liquefaction and sand ejecta with the damage of 50 to 51,000 um, structures from liquefaction and economic loss of $40 billion uh, where about a third of that, which is uh, attributed to liquefaction induced damage, uh, according to my colleague, uh, Shord Van Balagoy. So the, the New Zealanders wanted to see if they could improve a zone of soil, maybe four meters thick to support the soil weight and let the soil underneath that improved zone liquefy so that they could um, minimize differential settlement and have the building perform in an acceptable way at a lower cost than they would otherwise uh, do. And so they uh, asked us to participate in, in creating liquefaction uh, in the underlying soil using blast uh, induced um, techniques. The soil profile at the site we were testing there in Christchurch is shown here. It's a clean um, medium dense sand uh, with the water table at about two meters. Uh, velocity is about a little below 200 meters per second and relative density is about 60%. So we constructed um, three auger cast piles with a diameter of about 60 centimeters. We monitored pore pressure, we monitored settlement uh, from our blasting and we did in-situ tests before and after treatment. So I put three piles, these three piles down, one extended to eight and a half meters, another to 12 meters, and a third to 14 meters. And our objective was to set off these explosive charges and liquefy layers of soil so that I would have one test pile where the toe was in liquefied soil and two other test piles with, with piles below the liquefied zone. So we did uh, first the test with no pile, no load on the piles. Here you see these uh, three test piles here, here, and here. <clears throat> and these were uh, investigated along with other ground improvement uh, strategies that could be employed. <clears throat> Subsequently, we loaded the piles up and did a static load tests as best we could uh, using dead weights. So we didn't have the problem we had in Vancouver. So we applied 270 tons of loading on the test piles. So here's the auger cast pile being put in place. I think you use these in India. Uh, we auger down to the depth of interest. We um, use the auger as a casing. As the ca auger is pulled up, we inject grout. And then we vibrate the casing back down into the grout and that's our uh, completed test or completed pile. And to monitor behavior, we have sister bar strain gauges and we have thermal integrity sensors to monitor the diameter of the pile. It was a good thing we did this. They were designed to be 60 centimeters in diameter, but based on this tomographic principle of the thermal integrity profile ometer, we found that our, our piles were actually 70 to 75 uh, centimeters in diameter. Uh, we supported our piles with a, a frame with the weights stacked on top of this frame 
And then between each of the piles in the frame, we had a load cell to monitor the load carried by each of the piles. Uh, to uh, save money and uh, allow us to do three tests with limited budget, we uh, moved the test, we moved the weights around to be loaded over the top of each pile so we could uh, kind of do a static load test. Uh, it was a little frightening, but we got the job done. Uh, here's uh, for the eight and a half meter pile, we were able to get a complete load deflection curve, but for the other uh, piles, we only got to, to a settlement of about 10 millimeters, but we got most of the side friction and some of end bearing. Uh, so this is a, a test again with no piles, uh, with no load in place, and I'm going to show you, uh, this is our test piles he here, and there's four different ground improvement strategies along with no improvement strategy. Hundreds of, char of kilograms of charges are going to be detonated here. My wife asked me if they pay me to do this work because it looks like I'm just having a good time. Uh, what was the result of this? You can see that the water pressure has caused the, uh, the sand grains to, uh, that is not sand grains to come to the ground straight surface. out of the ground. And so we see these uh, sand volcanoes or sand boils forming uh, throughout the, the site. So here's one particularly, these are the sand, uh, um, this is the sand ejector around our piles, so we knew that we were getting liquefaction. <clears throat> this is a particularly large one uh, here. Um, we also measure the pore pressure, so we have the vertical effective stress shown by this line. The excess pore pressure is shown in red, and we've essentially liquefied the soil all the way to 13 meters. We used a little bit too much explosive in this situation, but um, we can still see what uh, happened. Uh, Mike Olson at Oregon State um, helped us with laser scanning, so we know the settlement of the soil relative to the piles, and this pile and the soil is settling more than the test piles in this case. So as a result of that, we have negative skin friction, which is developing. The colored lines are the measured uh, load in the pile, and the dashed lines are the uh, percentage of the static load resistance that gives us the best agreement with what was measured. So in each case, we have a neutral plane. The neutral plane becomes deeper as we move, as the pile is uh, deep, is, extends to greater depth. So above the neutral plane, we have negative friction. Below the neutral plane, we have positive friction in each of these cases. And uh, if we compare with the static resistance in the liquefied layers, we have about, well, let's see, 43 to 55% of the static resistance that we had before liquefaction. So this is in uh, rough agreement with what we had at our test site in Canada. Uh, the neutral plane location is consistent with what we'd expect based on the settlement of the piles, which was encouraging. And then we did a, another test where we had the 20, 270 ton loads uh, on the piles in place. And we started to get a little nervous about this because if, um, if this one pile settled excessively, the whole structure might tip over and uh, our, our test would be ruined. So what I did is shift the weights around so that the factor of safety was very low over the 8.5 meter pile and it was uh, deeper, or the factor of safety was very low. Sorry, did I say that wrong? It was high under the shallow piles and it was low under the deeper piles. So this is a video of that. Uh, I was quite nervous. And the line shows you where we are. Settled. 
didn't have it available. And afterwards, you can see that there was this characteristic uh, sand volcano indicating that we'd had liquefaction develop. Uh, here again is the vertical effective stress. In this case, we didn't liquefy the soil quite as much because it had already settled um, in somewhat in the previous test, but we're still getting 80% excess pore pressure down to maybe 12 millimeters. Uh, again, now uh, we measured settlement of the soil and the piles because of this bigger load are settling more than the surrounding soil. So if we look at the soil in the liquefied zone, we're seeing about 42% uh, of the static capacity in that zone. And below in the non-liquefied soil, our skin friction is about the same as the skin friction during the static load test. Uh, I'll show you maybe one more and then I need to move on. So we, we have um, uh, the Mirabello Italy test, which is where I am today. This was a, a single micro pile. Uh, we're setting off explosive charges um, at two levels, about um, 1.8 kilograms and 2.5 kilogram uh, charges. We monitor the settlement with the profilometer, the Sondex pipe. We monitor settlement, um, or, or we monitor strain in the pile with strain gauges and monitor the pore pressure with the pore pressure transducers. The micro pile is about 25 centimeters in diameter. There's a steel pipe that acts as the reinforcement. And then there's cement grout around uh, and in between and inside the pipe. This is a photo of the strain gauges uh, put in place. And after the test, we exhumed the micropile to see if we had the diameter we were expecting and it uh, looked like it was pretty close to what we designed. Uh, we didn't have uh, money for a, st a static load test in this case, but we did the next best thing which was to do drop load tests and use a pile driving analyzer. So we have a 700 kilogram weight drop from 20, 50, and 70 centimeters. And we use cap lap to determine the capacity. This gives us the side friction and the toe resistance for the test pile. So here's a video of the test in Mirabal. went off a little faster than we wanted to accommodate the driller, the blasters. Um, but we did uh, again see liquefaction. I'm just going to skip right to the end here. Uh, this orange line or reddish line uh, is the negative friction we'd expect if there was no reduction in capacity based on the cap lap analysis. But you can uh, from zero to six meters where we have clay in the profile. We see that our uh, measured side friction is about the same as what CAPWAP predicts. But when we go into the liquefied zone here, uh, the side friction uh, decreases. And if you look at that, it's on the order of 40 to 50% uh, lower than this negative, the, the negative friction you would expect if there were no liquefaction here. Uh, we're um, seeing an end bearing resistance of about 187 kilonewtons, um, extrapolating down from our strain gauges. Uh, this is the location of the neutral plane uh, based on settlement. Or based on load, and it corresponds roughly with the ground settlement, uh, with the location where the pile settlement and the ground settlement are the same. The settlement of the ground in this case was about 17 centimeters, but the pile settlement was only about 15 millimeters. So just because you have a very large amount of liquefaction due settlement doesn't mean that you'll have a lot of pile settlement. It largely depends on the end bearing resistance you have for your, your pile. Um, this uh, is the QZ curve that shows the toe resistance versus deflection from cap wrap. 
uh, for uh, different cases of loading. And for the blast test, uh, in comparison to what we got from the field test, we're getting about um, 195 kilonewtons, which was in very good agreement with our measured toe resistance. In the non-liquefied soil above the pile, above the, in the clay, we're getting a, a side friction of about uh, 82%, um, possibly due to some water moving up along the interface. And in the liquefied zone, we're seeing a, a, about 46% of the friction that we had before. Uh, one last test we did was in Arkansas, where we preloaded uh, driven piles, a 45 centimeter diameter pile and uh, 1.4 to 1.8 meter diameter board piles. And this uh, plot shows that we've liquefied a zone from about nine to uh, 14 meters. Uh, the settlement uh, in the soil was about uh, 95 millimeters and the settlement of the soil was only eight millimeters because of the large end bearing capacity we, we still had. If we look at the neutral plane where the maximum load is the highest and the neutral plane where the settlement is the same as the pile, they're very close to one another. And the end bearing resistance at 600 kilonewtons is about what we would expect from uh, the QZ curve uh, based on um, O'Neill and um, uh, Reese. So this all is fitting together quite nicely and, and the conclusions we're seeing is that in non-liquefied soil the negative friction is roughly equal to the positive friction. In liquefied soils the negative and positive skin friction after liquefaction and reconsolidation was somewhere between 40 and 55 percent of the skin friction before liquefaction. These results are uh, quite consistent for all the available tests. And now there are 14 test piles which are showing the same result. And, and they suggest that this might be a typical result to expect for design. The depth to the neutral plane increased and settlement decreased as the pile length uh, increased. And the settlement we're seeing is generally consistent with the neutral plane concept. There are some inconsistencies in a few cases, but it's generally consistent. So the way we'd suggest to design, it would be first to determine the settlement versus depth uh, and assume a neutral plane location using whatever is your favorite method for estimating settlement. So this might be your zone of liquefied soil and this would be your estimate of settlement of the soil. All right, and then you just decide on a neutral plane um, and you'll have to iterate, you'll have to change the location to get agreement, but just assume some value to begin with. Now we're going to compute the load distribution in the pile. We'll have negative friction above the neutral plane, positive friction below our assumed neutral plane, and we'll use 50% of the skin friction in the liquefied layers. And we'll use this to find the toe resistance uh, QB. So we would start off at the load that we've applied we'd have negative skin friction increasing down to the, our assumed neutral plane. And we'd have positive skin friction uh, decreasing the load in the pile down to the end of the pile. And this would be our um, toe resistance that we'd need to have for equilibrium on this pile. Now we need to determine the settlement of the toe of the pile. And we can um, do this by uh, taking the settlement of the soil at the neutral plane and subtracting off the elastic compression of the, of the pile below the neutral plane. And this will give us the settlement uh, expected at the toe of the pile. Lastly, we can use the QZ curve to determine if the mobilized toe resistance is equal to the toe resistance that's required for equilibrium. So we'll use that settlement go to our uh, QZ curve for that settlement and get this um, required Q sub B value. And we compare those two, are they consistent with one another? Are they the same? If they're different, then we need to revise our neutral plane location and repeat the process until we uh, get convergence so that the neutral plane 
so we get the same Q sub B for uh, both cases. And we think this uh, process could be something that could be used with uh, relatively little difficulty in routine design. I appreciate your attention and uh, uh, want to ask maybe if there are questions about um, what we presented here today. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rollins. And uh, it was a, an excellent lecture and especially you have uh, uh, presented the case histories, actual tests, actual tests. So we also say in Hindi that pratyaksh ko pramad ki jarurat nahi hoti means if something is visible uh, before your eyes, then there is no uh, requirement of any proof. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. testing, uh, especially in geotechnical engineering, these field tests are very important and you have shown the importance of these large scale testing by your presentation. So it was uh, an excellent lecture. Thank you so much for that. So now I, now I request uh, Professor Darren to start discussions. Hello, oh, Professor. Uh, uh, uh... Uh, Professor Rollins, uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the wonderful um, talk. Um, well, I'm a more experimental person, so 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 I can totally uh, enjoy you know what that you have done. The field work um, is really impressive. It's really impressive, uh, and and you know and this must have taken uh, lots of uh, planning, lots of hard work, and not forgetting also you know to to you know to secure the funding you know to do field tests. I think these are all very. Uh, uh, very, very, very tough. Uh, you know, thank you to to, to uh, you know to make it happen as uh, you know as what as what uh, um, that you know uh, um, uh, that our chair said is that uh, that few tests is the truth. It's, you know, so the results that we have gotten from few you know from few tests is uh, indeed uh, uh, very crucial for us to do you know be. Be it to understand the failure mechanisms, be whether to do calibrations for our numerical work. I think certainly all of these are huge, huge uh, contributions. Uh, you know that what that you have done. You know, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so far, um, I think we are still waiting for questions to to come in. Uh, perhaps I will just ask a question uh, pertaining to the blast, uh, the blast liquefaction um, experiments that you have done. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, based on your view, uh, how would blast uh, liquefaction, uh, you know, uh, be able to represent earthquake, uh, and especially when it comes to down drag uh, of the pulse, um, how would it differ? Because what I do see from your presentation is that the blast, uh, the blast uh, liquefaction uh, occurs at a deeper depth, and then subsequently the shallower um, explosive is being uh, detonated. Uh, after that. So I'm just wondering, in this case, uh, would the liquefaction progress from the bottom up, whereas in the case of uh, earthquake-induced uh, liquefaction, the, uh, that the liquefaction generally uh, develops from the water table to the greater depths. So uh, would the analysis of our down drag differ? Uh, well, certainly that the concept, that the theories, it will still be the same. But I'm just wondering whether um, uh, are we going to expect a larger settlement, or you think that you know that uh, they eventually, when the excess pore pressure uh, dissipates, you know, and the settlements, it will still be uh, the same? That's that's a very good question. There are certainly some issues involved and differences between what we do and what an earthquake does in reality, and and we don't deny that. Um, we wish we could. We are we're trying to detonate our explosives sequentially now with a second or so in between so we at least have 16 seconds for pore pressures to develop uh, so it's more like an, an earthquake event and and we blast from one side to the other so we have a wave front going in two different directions to try and better simulate this but we we can't do it completely 
uh, I'm kind of an impatient person, and so this is a good method for me. I don't have to wait for an earthquake. I can simulate it like this. Uh, my colleague uh, Armin Studlein at Oregon State University has done some testing, and um, his results seem to indicate that most of the core pressure that's generated is due to shear strain rather than just compressive strain like many of us have thought for years. Um, uh, even though a compression wave goes through the profile, uh, there's a, a shear strain component that does develop afterwards and, and uh, is responsible for much of the residual excess pore pressure. Um, we also think that the settlement, well, at least in our cases, maybe we've been lucky, but um, if you have enough explosives and not too much, you get a settlement that's quite similar to what you would expect in an earthquake event. And we think the combination of the high excess pore pressure with the amount of settlement that is similar to an earthquake, we, we get a um, kind of a reasonable rep representation of what might happen. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, uh, uh, my view is that if I were to, to, do, to do a few tests, I would have done, done likewise because I, 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 you know, yeah, you know, for blast wise, uh, you know, the best that we can do is just, you know, have it to be, to be done uh, sequentially and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and just wait for the liquefaction uh, <laughs> to happen, right? And, and then thereafter we do some measurements. You know, and, yeah, but certainly I think uh, for the down drag, um, uh, study. I think this is something which is uh, very uh, helpful uh, to the practicing engineers. I think, uh, to be honest, is that I have yet to, you know, to to you know to see you know such a extensive work being done pertaining to uh, to down drag, you know, following, uh, you know, yeah, following a huge uh, uh, liquefaction event so uh yeah so indeed just now when you were sharing uh, you know it was really really enjoying uh you know to to, to listen to um there is uh, there is a question that just uh, came in um the question is after the explosion what is yes, the percentage yeah. improvement of n values of soils in the liquefied soil i suppose the n values is pertaining to the spt yes yeah uh, we, we see some increase in the, so we're not trying to improve the ground with the blasting, but there is a ground improvement strategy known as uh, explosive compaction. And they usually use charges that are larger than the explosive charges that we use. So our, our objective is not necessarily to, to densify the soil in the process, but we do see some increase. And, but it's relatively small, maybe like a 15% increase in the cone tip resistance or flow count. And many times, uh, it's un interesting to me that um, after the liquefaction takes place, these soil particles are forced apart and the structure is kind of disturbed and disrupted. So it takes some time for that structure to get back into place and start to age. Uh, so we find that many times it requires uh, two or three months for the soil structure to regain its, its bond and get back to the cone, tip, cone resistance that you had before the blast. So in the testing that we're um, undertaking now, we're going to, um, we did a test, a static load test before the blast we're going to do another static load test on a separate pile immediately after the blast. And then we're going to do a static load test on a third separate pile in a few months after the blast to see what, uh, what um, increase in resistance that we get, or if we can at least get back to the same pile capacity that we had before the blast. Wow, this is, this is really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you know, there was certainly, uh, uh, look forward to more updates uh, from you uh, in your testing. Uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Jaka has a question. Um, yeah. oh, please. Uh, Professor Rowling, uh, thank you very much for presenting such a nice uh, comprehensive study. It's really exciting. 
uh, I just have one curious question. Like I understood, like uh, um, drown drag is going to increase the load, but uh, thing is, uh, liquefa when liquefaction occurs, soil loses the strength, load increases. Perfect. Then when the soil is settling, drown drag is going to increase the load, but these yeah. two are going to occur one after other. After the liquefaction, once pore water pressure starts dissipating, then drown drag occurs. Okay, but yeah, in a uh, real scenario, uh, when the structure uh, is applying load on the pile, load on the pile during the shaking is going to be more. And at that time, yes, we can. We are ignoring and then we are converting everything to the end, end loading. But uh, when drown drag is uh, applying load, the structural load will not be there. Additional structural load, inertial load will not be there. So are they not kind of compensating? Um, well, in our tests, we've had cases where there, where there is no structural load, just because it's um, difficult to apply that, that load. As you saw in some of those cases, uh, it costs a lot of money to, to provide a dead weight uh, so most of our tests have, have not involved any structural loading, but in, in reality, in most cases, there is a applied load that remains constant during the earthquake shaking. And you're correct that there will be some inertia forces that go up and down and increase the load on the pile, uh, which you know, I'm not denying could have some effect because you're, you're, like in our case, you saw the piles when we reloaded, the skin friction went positive at the top of the pile. So there could be some effects like this. Um, uh, but I think the net, net behavior will be what happens at the end of the earthquake shaking. And, and in that shaking, when the skin friction decreases due to liquefaction, uh, as you saw in that one video, uh, you're going to get some immediate settlement due to the liquefaction and the reduction in and side friction in the liquefied zone. But we think in addition to that, after the pore pressures dissipate, you'll get some additional settlement due to down drag um, in the, even the liquefied soil and the pile and the soil above the test pile, or sorry, the soil above the liquefied zone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. It's uh, been a pleasure to. Uh, uh, Professor Darren, there are yes, two, three yes, there are, yes, there are more questions coming in. Uh, oh. um, yes, the next question. Yeah, uh, this is, the next question is uh, how the blast charges are decided for inducing the liquefaction in soil. I think this is a very uh, uh, good question. Uh, you know, which I'm also very keen to find out. Um, that's a good question. We, we initially uh, used some experimental data from um, Studer and Koch, and they had used much larger charges. In fact, they'd used even nuclear blast <laughs> uh, case histories where they were far away from the uh, nuclear blast, <laughs> of course. Uh, but um, that, that gives you a correlation between um, the excess pore pressure ratio and the scale distance. So the, the uh, weight of the charge divided by um, uh, the distance divided by the uh, weight of the charge to the one third power. Uh, so this gives you a, a correlation. And since that time, um, Professor Ashford and I have done a number of tests and combining all that data together, uh, one of his students has uh, provided an improved um, equation that, re that ac accounts for the weight of the charge and the density of the soil, because you can expect that a denser soil will take more energy to liquefy. And third, um, the depth. So as you go deeper in the profile, it takes more energy to liquefy the soil as well. And we've, we found this out <laughs> experimentally at our site in Arkansas, where we were trying to liquefy to a much greater depth. So the, the, there's an equation for predicting that behavior now. 
Thank you so much uh, for the sharing. Um, the next question is, um, uh, during the blasting, could you obtain the acceleration data generated? Uh, yes, we could. Um, we have our, our colleagues here from the Italian Institute, National Institute for Geophysics and Volcanoes, and, and they set out a large array of um, ground motion recording devices, and we also measure acceleration um, in the ground itself. So as you would expect, uh, close into the blast, um, uh, we get... Um, we get accelerations that are much larger than you would have in an earthquake. So, you know, on the orders of uh, maybe 10 G or something like this, but as you move away, uh, that it becomes closer to what you would see in an earthquake. And our colleagues from the Italian Institute say that when we're uh, about a hundred meters away, that it's not the frequency content and so forth is not much different than an earthquake, but uh, we're, we're not so much concerned about the acceleration as we are with the velocity, and the velocity is, um, uh, seems reasonable. Uh, and again, we're not trying to simulate a, a, an earthquake. We're just trying to induce pore pressures that would be induced by an earthquake. So the, the peak ground accelerations are much higher than you would record in an actual earthquake, but we think the strains are, are compatible. Sorry, I have, a, I have a leading question uh, um, on this. I have came across um, blast tests uh, done by others uh, who, who tried to create soy uh, liquefaction. However, what they have seen was a huge increase in excess pore pressure uh, to liquefaction. However, the dissipation was also very quick. So uh, uh, the ground is actually uh, fine, fine, fine sandy material. Uh, and they are just wondering whether, uh, why aren't they able to, to see that sustained uh, gradual dissipation of excess pore pressure? What is your, your, your take on this? Um, you know, uh, has the blast been done in the wrong manner or, or you feel that what can be improved? Um, well, we, we try to, uh, liquefy a, a larger volume. So we, we've often used a ring that has a radius of about uh, five meters. Uh, in our test to, on Friday, it's going to be, have a radius of seven meters because we're testing a pile group. So um, having a larger volume um, of liquefied soil will cause it to um, dissipate slower. So in New Zealand, we had five uh, different rings and there was a large volume of soil that was liquefied. Uh, if they've blasted and have just a very small diameter, uh, then soil can, uh, pore pressures can dissipate horizontally and also vertically. And this uh, allows them to dissipate much more rapidly. Uh, the other thing that uh, slows the dissipation process is that uh, if you have a clay layer at the top, like in several of the cases, we had clay that was, um, well, in this site we're working now is six meters of clay. And so that takes, um, you know, it takes about an hour for the excess pore pressures to get back down to static levels. I see. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Okay. So Thank you so much, Professor Brandenburg and uh, Professor uh, uh, Rollins for excellent lectures. And uh, uh, let us appreciate the efforts of both the professors by just clapping. And thank you so much for uh, giving uh, time to this particular conference. So now thank you so much. And now over to Professor Jakka. Thank you, Professor. Uh, first of all, we are thankful to both our speakers, uh, respected uh, Professor uh, Kane Rollins and uh, Professor uh, Bradenberg for uh, sparing their uh, valuable time with uh, all of us. And I also thank uh, our chair, Professor Samadhiya and co-chair, Professor Darren, for nicely and lively conducting this session. Thank you very much, sir, all of you.
uh, I request all the participants uh, to move to the parallel halls. Uh, maybe we are, I think, little bit uh, running late. So maybe in few minutes, we'll be starting in parallel halls. Thank you, one and all. See you.